three years ago, I was in Japan with my husband going through immigration. And the charming young man who was dealing with the passports examined my husband's passport and then turned to my husband and said, could I have your mother's passport now? <laughs> I fell into a pit. The slough of despond, a swamp of despair. Okay, so I do have white hair, but did I really look that old? When I looked at my hands and I see the blue veins like rivers running across them and the dark spots that my mother so lovingly called liver spots, I supposed I might be. I fell into a sort of, I suppose, a depression. 69 had been absolutely fine. It had a different ring to it. But 70, I hated. So for two years, I felt absolutely dreadful. I didn't know how I'd get out of things. There were Armani jackets hanging in my closet with their skinny woman arms, reminding me of what had been. Because, of course, I piled on weight. I grieved for the moment when, at 60, dressed in the most divine purple bias-cut silk dress, I walked through town. And a gentleman who was obviously a visitor to Hong Kong said, Woman, you look good. <laughs> Boy, that was great. But it changed. And that had passed. I had, in a way, become invisible. <coughs> My marriage changed. And I just lost confidence in who I was. And I forgot, in a way, how to communicate. I couldn't even communicate with myself. But why? Was it death that scared me? No way. My mother's family had been village undertakers, and I spent my childhood playing amongst the coffins in my grandfather's workshop. In fact, I made my first bra out of coffin lining. <laughs> now, most of you will not have seen coffin lining, right? I saw a lot. And it was perfect because it was white, it was shiny, it was lacy, and it was scalloped. Now, <laughs> I was seven years old, so in fact, I had no breasts, but I had a bra. <laughs> no, it wasn't death. It wasn't death I was frightened of, but it was longevity. All my mum's family, who were females, lived into their hundreds. And I couldn't bear the thought of another 30 years of that pit. The depression was like a, a grey cloud. It was like living in grey cotton wool. But something came to me, and it was a song from my childhood from Wales, and a word, hiraith. Now, hiraith is almost untranslatable into English. Some people would say, oh, it means um, missing your home. But it's really more than that. It's really a need to return to where your spirit lives. And that was it. I realized I had to get back to where my spirit, whatever it was, whatever made me me, I had to get back to that. Now, did this sort of invisibility really, really matter? In fact, you know, it didn't. Because I realized that I was freer than ever to be whoever I wanted to be. No longer did I have to run in the yummy mummy race or the glamorous grandma steaks. It didn't matter. I could just be me. And what was the most important thing to me? It was connecting with people. Not the sort of connections when you go to cocktail parties, this great pageantry you have there, or business connections. But it was much more those exquisite moments which are like sparks of electricity which feed your spirit and where joy really lies. Now, here's an example. I had gone to Ikea, and I had bought a great big white polar bear. I don't know if anyone's seen these, but they're wonderful. They're great, big, fluffy, cuddly. They're this big, right? Polar bear cubs. And I called mine Kurtag, because Kurtag is one of my favorite composers. So I'm coming back from Ikea on the MTR. And I didn't want to wrap Kurtag up, because you know it takes a lot of wrapping paper. So I'm sitting down in the MTR with Kurtag on my lap, and he's big. 
And two ladies across from me obviously are looking at me thinking, what is this woman doing with this stuff there? And I picked up Kurtag's paw and I waved it at them. <laughs> and what did they do? They giggled and waved right back. <laughs> you see, that's the thing about a connection because it leaves an echo. Those ladies could remember, maybe they're remembering now that crazy woman who waved a polar bear paw at them. You see, they can be, the connections can be transient, but what they do is leave an echo in someone's life, always. So I had to return, I knew, to where these connections were most important. Many, many years ago, I had been involved in suicide prevention in UK and continued when I came to Hong Kong in the 70s. But then, as so often happens in our lives, things go wrong, you have difficulties, and you know it's time to take a break. But then it occurred to me, Brenda, you're so stupid when you go back to what you used to love. So I applied again, I trained again, in suicide prevention, and I went back to where these connections are anything but joyful. Because here you are connecting with someone's fear, with their darkness. You just have to be and you have to listen. But it is the most heartfelt connection you could wish. And again, it's so precious. And it is here, right? Coming back to where your spirit lives. And that's what that connection was all about. There is one part of my life where a connection didn't happen. And that was with my mother. This is my mum, drawn by my father, who was an artist. I'm actually in the picture, but she's pregnant with me at four months. Now, my mum had me just after the war. She came from a large family, but there were no other children. And she chose to follow a New Zealand pediatrician called Dr. Truby King. I don't know how she heard about him, but she obviously thought maybe this is the way to bring a baby up. And he had very strict rules for how to treat infants, newborn infants. For example, he would say that the most important thing is discipline and detachment. Yes, detachment. The child was to be fed by the clock. I suppose every what would be four hours. Never at night. True being babies were very often hungry. If you didn't take your feed at the appointed time, hard luck. Your mother was not allowed to pick you up in between. So as a result, I find it very hard to be away from food. I just need to know somehow it's available. Have I got something in my bag? Uh, is there a shop nearby where if I feel those hunger pangs, I can get food? Which is a result of that. Truby King babies were to be potty trained from five weeks. My mother went one better. It was her proud boast that she never had a dirty nappy from me, a wet one, but never a dirty one, because I was on the pot from birth, the first day. Dear Dr. King believed that regular bowel movements were really important to prevent premature sexuality in the child. It didn't work with me. <laughs> you know, I can laugh about it now. And my mother did the best she could, the best she knew. It was horrendous when I think about it. And I've met other Truby King babies my age. And they tell the same story, that there was never a real connection with their mums, even though they knew they were good women. Because... If you're only allowed to cuddle your baby 10 minutes a day, you don't get this connection. 
You see, the connection was supposed to come later, but of course, it never did. But she was a kind woman and an honest woman, and I learned many things from her. We just never had that bonding of mother and daughter. Now, my father was a different matter. My father was a musician and a, and a painter and a crazy little man. And he absolutely walked his own path. He fitted no mold. And my dad taught me to be, no, not exactly taught me to be, but showed me what unconventionality was because he didn't follow his own path, but I learned to do it. Now, my path was anything but easy. It was, let's say, extremely rocky. It was kind of, yes, very difficult. And there were often times when I made terrible mistakes as I grew up. And I live with some of them now, because that's what life is like, right? You can't always put things aside. But I found out very early, without understanding what it was that was in me, that I was somehow a bit different. Now, I had no teaching about sexuality when I was very young. Of course, no internet, you know, no books you could read. But as I grew older, I began to realize that maybe I didn't think quite the same way as my friends. Maybe my interests weren't the same. It was vague and it had no name. But as I grew older and I got more education, I realized that I was what you call now kinky. <laughs> I wish those were my legs, but they're not. <laughs> yeah, so here I was, um, a young woman in this maelstrom of sexuality, not really knowing which was left and right in a way, but just knowing this was for me, it was my essence, absolutely my essence. So let's fast forward to the 90s in Hong Kong when my husband and I started a business in Hong Kong called Fetish Fashion. Fetish Fashion was a place which was really designed for BDSM. That's bondage, dominance, sadomasochism. It's a wonderful word, isn't it? But this is what people wanted. This is what I wanted. And we wanted to make a place where people could come together to meet other people who felt the same. Because, you know, we have a right to our sexualities. And a very wise woman, a psychologist, told me once, until you are at ease with your sexuality, no matter what that sexuality is, you can be gay, straight, bi, it doesn't matter. You must be at ease with your sexuality or you cannot be all you are meant to be. And that is so absolutely true. It doesn't matter whether you don't like sex, maybe you are asexual, that's really all right as long as you are all right with it. And I, I thought that woman really taught me a huge amount. Being different, being sexually different, being in a sexual minority is very hard. Make no mistake about that. Because we all search for connection. We all search for communication. You know, we... Most of us, and I dare say all of you, in fact, we fear we are alone in our difference while others are together in their similarities. And that's, that is true. And I think it's probably true for all of us. We have these fears. Oh, other people don't, they're not like me. I'm, I'm, I'm in a minority over here while others are together in their, in their similarities. Now, you will imagine my surprise when having given 100 parties for the community where people could come together and in, enjoy uh, BDSM together, on our 100th play party, the police raid. <laughs> 27 policemen rush in, arrest everyone who's at the party. And they separate us into different rooms because we have three rooms. They put the men in one, we put the women in another, and the chief libertines, my husband, myself, and our manager, in a third. But one wonderful cross-dresser is put in with the women. <laughs> <laughs> Success! <laughs> okay, so here we are, 
Uh, they haven't taken us yet to the police station. And I'm sitting one side of the room with six police women in an arc around me. My husband is sitting the other side with an arc of police men around him. And they search him, they body search him, and they find an object they don't quite understand. <laughs> and they start pressing the buttons on this. <laughs> Unknown to them, this is the remote control for the vibrating panties that I'm wearing. <laughs> make it up, right? <laughs> Thank goodness, um, by training I'm an actress, because believe you me, I had to really keep a very straight face <laughs> at that point. So we are taken, they decided they're going to take us to Central Police Station, everybody who's at the party. And we get there and I have my fingerprints taken. And I have to tell you, it's one of the most intimidating and degrading things I've ever had done. I don't know how many of you have had your fingerprints taken, but you know someone's hanging onto your fingers and they press it into the pad and then they press it onto the paper. It's really kind of dehumanizing. But while I'm having it done, a big burly policeman comes along and he reaches behind him and takes off a pair of very heavy handcuffs and throws them down in front of me, presumably to frighten me. Ah, well, that didn't work, did it? <laughs> you know, I mean, let's face it, you know, someone was into bondage, you kidding? <laughs> and I thought, well, break your handcuffs. <laughs> I did not tell them that, though. <laughs> so, um, everyone, I don't even know where my husband is, where our guests are. I'm separated from them, and it's cold. And quite honestly, I'm pretty frightened. I've never had a speeding ticket. And here I am in a police station under arrest. So when you're in there, everything is designed to intimidate you and to isolate you. And it does really work. So anyway, a year later, it took them a year to decide whether they could actually charge us with anything. But we were charged, 25 charges. I mean, the mind boggles, doesn't it, really? So here I am, defendant one in court. The courts are, they're theatrical, they're utilitarian, but they are ultimately dehumanizing. I felt like I was a spectator in my own life. So I answered not guilty to every charge, but I still feel the loneliness and the isolation and the unfairness of being there. And what had we done? We had allowed people to express their sexualities. It was not a sex party. There was no sex in the parties, but they were allowed to enjoy the sexuality that they had been born with. I discovered later because obviously I, I had friends in the judiciary, I discovered that Central Police Station were very low on vice numbers. They hadn't had enough vice arrests. I guess they've got to have their quotas, right? They thought I was running a brothel, and I was not running a brothel. They could not understand that there could be a business which was basically erotic in content that was not illegal. So, there was one particular witness, and he had come to three parties, undercover, of course. I suppose he came to find out what we were doing, and we nicknamed him Dave the Bum. <laughs> and when, when you saw Dave, you would understand why we nicknamed him Dave the Bum. He had a body of carved mahogany. He was so beautiful, and he had the most amazingly spankable bum. <laughs> so Dave came to three parties over three months. I had no idea he was a policeman, because all he ever wore when he came into the party was a little red leather pouch 
with yellow flames leaping up over it. He was really an undercover, a less than cover cop, believe you me. <laughs> and we made tremendous friends. He was just a lovely man. He had a ball and we had a ball. No idea he was a policeman. I knew police had come into the parties at some point. They were easy to spot because they had police issue fetish gear. <laughs> and they, it's true. <laughs> and they all looked the same. They all had these little little like, PBC shorts. And I remember lining three of them up and saying, boys, do you belong to a club or something? Because you all look the same. I accepted that police would be interested in what we did. But as far as I was concerned, we were doing nothing wrong. Now, do remember the name of Dave, because he's coming back at the end of this. The trial lasted three weeks. I sketched, as my dad would have done had he been in the same position. Now, in fact, Dave is in here somewhere, as is um, our expert witness, as is the magistrate, as is some lots of the witnesses. And isn't it interesting that you actually can't tell who's who, except for the magistrate, but Dave is there. Unfortunately, I couldn't do him justice, but that's life, right? But we did get justice in the end, and we had not guilty to all 25 charges. So we'd won. Going back over my 30 years of journals, I've kept journals for 30 years, when I was in that pit that I was in, I read about the trial, I read about all the work we had done to try to bring people together to meet other people who shared the same feelings. It helped me tremendously because I was able to look back and think, no, that was the right thing to do. That was a good thing to do. It's all about connection and helping people. Helping people find their own way home. And don't we all, don't we all want to feel we've found our home? And we want to feel that we have found people who see us, who really, really see us, and really, really hear us. Now, the years have passed. I'm still here. I'm changed, very changed. But then we're all going to change, aren't we? I'm a bit faded, like the tulips, I suppose. But, you know, in aging and slight fading, there is a beauty. And there is a beauty of fragility in that. None of us are going to stay the same. Most of you have more left, more time left than I do. Use that time. Use that time to make these wonderful, magical connections with people which will leave an echo in their life. Have the courage to do that because it may be the gift that the other person really needs. Let's get back to Dave. I promised you a return. And here it is. It's after the trial, about a few months after the trial, and I'm on the number 13 bus, and I'm sitting next to a big window on the ground floor of the bus. And it has to stop because it's turning into a main road. And as it stops, I'm conscious that a police van has drawn up alongside. Now, of course, for many months, I, I avoided police cars, police men, anything, but I turned. And there was Dave the Bum, <laughs> magnificent in his uniform. And we looked at each other, and we smiled, and we grinned, and we waved in absolute recognition that we had shared the same things and some great times. But that was the most wonderful, wonderful ending for me to the trauma of the trial. And it's a great ending to my talk. Thank you. Thank you.